Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Today's video was brought to you by Predictable Revenue's Service LinkedIn Outbound. Find out how we can leverage and grow your existing LinkedIn network to book meetings into your calendar at the link below. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart, and today I'm joined by Ari Levine from Tumblr. You might know him from Gary V. He's also started his own company in the media space, and we are talking about how we've lost the human element in sales. Ari, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Colin. It's great to be I'm, here. I'm excited. You got you got quite the background. Tumblr also being part of Automatic. I think the you know just a great team to be on in general. Um, I love the experience with Gary V. I love the startup. You've got your own startup experience. You're a man who's sold in multiple different contexts, different types of you know whether it's advertising or software tools. You've got quite the background here, and so I'm curious when you say we've lost that human element. What uh, what, what do you what do you mean by that? Yeah. Yeah. Well. What I mean by the human, human element takes me back to before my days selling advertising, before my days selling software. I actually started my professional job, career, my first job out of college in the diamond business. So I was going door to door around the United States and then I eventually moved to Australia and did it there, selling diamonds to mom and pop jewelry stores. And I spent hours sitting in the back of their stores with them, doing business, trying to understand what they needed, seeing how they reacted to other vendors and other salespeople coming in. And I, and I studied this all day and I wasn't always successful, right? Sometimes I was sitting in the back of the store and a deal wouldn't happen. Sometimes I would knock on the door and no one would let me in. I don't know if you've been to a lot of jewelry stores, but you need to get buzzed in, right? So yeah. I would stand there sometimes going back every day or every week or every month and knocking on the door and not actually getting let in. And finally, sometimes they would let me in and I would say, why didn't you let me in? I've got, I've got the goods. Here's my business card. I work for a reputable company. What's the deal? And they would say, we just hate salespeople, right? And that stuck with me. And for a long time, I, I, I was a self-hating salesperson, right? Even my first time at Tumblr, I was like, let's call ourselves brand strategists so that people aren't, um, uh, aren't resistant to taking meetings with us. We, we used to joke that we were secret sales. And years ago, I read Daniel Pink's book, To Sell as Human, and it had a big impact on me. It made me not hate myself for being a salesperson. Um, and what I had seen back then when I was selling diamonds, what I've seen in tech and media, uh, and what I've seen from all bad salespeople that I've, I've uh, crossed paths with is that they match the, the word cloud, if you will, that Daniel Pink pulls together in that book. So when asking people to describe salespeople, they talk about things like difficult, pushy, pushy is the biggest one, yuck, hard, dishonest, and necessary, right? So this is what we're up against. This is what folks like you and I are up against every single day before we even walk in the door, right? So we have to do better. And we have to think about our consumers first as people. Before we send that first LinkedIn note with no context in the wrong name, before we uh, get on the call without having read anything about the, the company besides their Wikipedia page, before we press record and read a script and then pass it off to someone else with no context, why would we do these things? The, the, the cards are stacked against us. People want to ignore us. They want to dodge our calls. They want to dodge our email, emails. They want to move to the other way in the conference hall when they see us coming, right? And we know this. And we're people. And we don't want to be sold to in a pushy, yucky, sleazy necessary, uh, well, necessary we do, right? But annoying sort of way. As sellers, we know this. Uh, you know, you could say game recognize game. Sellers recognize respect and ultimately try and hire the best sellers that they cross paths with. I've done it. I'm sure you've done it. I'm sure everyone here has done it. I've bought things because I thought a salesperson was good. Things that I didn't need, things that I didn't want. Again, that may more from a consumer standpoint, right? From B2B, B2B it's a little bit different. But we know that we can and should do better. And that's how I try and approach everything. I try and approach it as a buyer. So in my, in my job at Tumblr, when I'm working with brands and I'm trying to help them sell to consumers on Tumblr, I try and put my, my uh, hat on and say, well, I'm this consumer. What does this mean to me? How do I feel? And in a B2B environment, when I'm going out and doing it, I say the same thing. I say, how do I want to be sold to? 
How do I want my day to be interrupted? How do I want to connect with people? And I've had a lot of roles. I've not always been the buyer. Sometimes I've been the executive sponsor or the influencer or just a homie who can make an introduction, right? Um, and it's been uh, service contracts and ad buying and software investments and all of it. So as a buyer and as other, uh, uh, an individual in that ecosystem, I've seen all these behaviors. I've had my time wasted. I've been frustrated. Um, and most importantly, for the people who are listening here, I've opted not to buy products from companies based on how I was treated during the sales process, right? based on the handoff of an SDR to an uh, account executive or account rep, right? based on an account executive that I'm speaking with ignoring me for weeks. And when I go around them to try and get movement, because I actually want to buy something now, getting nasty emails back because I went around them. Or, uh, you know, this is the worst one. And listen, I know it happens and it's the reality of our world. All of a sudden, I'm in the middle of a conversation and there's an account realignment. So suddenly the person who I've explained everything to and knows everything that I'm doing doesn't care anymore, right? Like literally, you could, you could hear it in their voice. They just don't even care, right? Because their goals aren't being aligned with the lifetime value of me as a consumer and the impact that I have on the business. They're aligned with closing a deal and moving on to the next one, which I think is just so broken. So I think that to make a long story short, and as you can tell here, I'm a talker, right? I think that we've automated. I think we track too much. I think we pass people off in the wrong way. Um, I think what so many people in our space do is so transparent that it puts off buyers. When, when I was sitting at VaynerMedia and I, I wasn't, wasn't necessarily a buyer, right? I would get an email and then I would turn to my colleague and I would say, did you get this email? And they said, yep, I got it. We'd go down the table and everyone got the same email, the same exact time, as if we weren't talking together. As if, and, and the response to that isn't, oh, wow, this is someone who's really trying. The response to that is, let's mark this person as spam and make sure that no one from this company gets through our, ad, our, our spam blockers again, right? Because it's not thoughtful. It's not human. And when I read sales blogs and I read books and I, I've, I've read so many of them, right? If I've spin selling, the little red book of selling, getting to yes, predictable revenue, all of them, right? Um, and and there's, there's the basics that we all know, but so many of the tactics that I think are so ugly today or so wrong are being celebrated. I once worked with a company that was obsessed with email open rates on drip campaigns from their salespeople, right? That's a best practice. You want to know if people are opening. But what happens if I told you after six months, never got a single deal out of any of those opens, right? There's something inherently broken. We become focused on building a machine and on automating everything and on making it fit into our system that we don't even analyze to what end it's working and how offensive it might be or disrespectful to our, to our audiences, to our consumers, to the people we're selling to. And look, I know people who work at privacy-focused companies who get so excited and share with everyone when an email starts bouncing around an office because they're using pixels to, to track their outbound efforts, right? Again, it's, it's common practice in, in sales uh, and, and using, using digital media, but it's the antithesis of where we're going as a culture, as people, right? We have new privacy laws. We have, we have ad blockers. Like we, we have people have said, as a consumer, I don't want this. And then we're saying, oh, but while you're at work, we're going we're to do all this shit to you right there anyway. And you don't even, probably don't even know that we're doing this stuff because there's even less transparency. And I don't think half the buyers out there know about this entire ecosystem of sales tools and sales enable, enablement and, and books and blogs and, and the whole world that we're a part of, you and I, right? Um, so we call people opportunities. We dehumanize them. We try and optimize these machines. And look, maybe I'm romantic, right? Maybe I'm romantic about backslapping, handshaking, face-to-face relationship-based sales. But I also know that if these systems can be optimized with software today, then it's only a matter of time between salespeople like you and I are, are out of jobs, right? So the only, the only future for salespeople is those that are relationship-driven or even more so reputation-driven, right? That are true category experts that don't understand their audience from uh, and their industry from multiple different sides and who think and behave and can act and interact with their buyers as if they were buyers themselves. It's sort of like all the technologies, sales loft, outreach, Salesforce, all the marketing and automation technologies have given this, given us this incredibly powerful Iron Man suit. And we're sitting there in this amazing suit 
and we're like, you know what, let's try and use it to sew. Like, yeah, I, I don't know much about like the lore or like how, how dexterous uh, he is when he's wearing that suit, but I imagine that's the wrong sort of tool for that job. Right. And I think there, there's so much, like you said, there's so many opportunities where people are saying, I have a problem. I want to solve it. And instead of saying, okay, is it, you know, sort of people process or technology is like, how do I want to solve this? They just, you jump right to technology. I'm as guilty of this as, as anybody else. And I work to try and sort of start with the other two. Um, but it's, it's so easy to, to just say, I have a problem. I'm going to spend 99, 99 a month uh, and try and solve that problem. That's right. Look, I, I think there is a process issue as well. I don't think it's just the technology. I think it's the process and, and the way we hand things off. And, and I think there's an interpersonal aspect at, at play as well. Right. And, um, and I think that this, this really has negative impacts on companies over the long term. Listen, to say that automated things and the handoff can't be done well is wrong, right? Like I'm not, I'm not saying it's all terrible. I've been sold things through this process and pushed through the sales funnel as a buyer that I've loved. I've, I recently started using uh, the Superhuman app for email. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Yep. yep. It, it was by far, and, and again, this isn't like big B2B enterprise technology. This is me paying $30 for an email client. It was probably the most excited I've been about buying a product online in a very, very long time. The handoff, the follow up the onboarding, right? Like an email app and they made me sit through 30 minutes of onboarding and all it did was add value. All it did was make me more excited for them to run my credit card and let me start using the app. So it can be done well, right? And, and again, we're talking $30 product. We could also be talking $3 million product. Obviously different variables, different levers, different process. So nothing is one size fits all. And I'm the first person to say that, right? I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm far from a Luddite. I believe in technology. I work in technology. I work in media. It's driven by technology. Uh, I just think that I see so much bad behavior in the market when I'm buying, right? And I see it from salespeople around me when they tell me what they're doing and how they're doing things. Uh, and I, I just, uh, I think we should all be more human and, th and think um, of, our, of our buyers as people, right? Because when you're making that $3 million enterprise solution sale, um, it's very easy to forget that like that person is a buyer, is, is a, that, that buyer is a person too, right? And they have different things that drive them and different motivator, motivators. And obviously we can look at the organizational motivators, but they have personal things, right? Does their job define them, right? Do they have other varied interests? Are they looking for a new job? Are they looking for a promotion? Do they want press? Do they want an award? Again, I, I, I sell into advertising, right? So, that, so that's a, a real dynamic, right? Does this person I'm speaking with care about what they're doing or do they want to get uh, a trip to the south of France in June when uh, the climate and world permits, obviously? Um, or do they really care about um, what's happening here? So, you know, that gets me into something I'm very passionate about, obviously, social selling. And uh, because what is that but selling as a human, you know? Totally agree. And I, I want to I want to ask you about social selling. Interesting parallel. Um, superhuman. I the, it came from the the guys that founded Reportive. Reportive was that cool uh, Chrome plugin that would basically when you hovered over somebody's email, it would show their LinkedIn profile in in your Gmail. Um, they got acquired by LinkedIn for a crazy amount of money a long time ago. This is their like their follow on to that. I remember signing up for Superhuman. It was still in beta. And I, <clears throat> I was a bad buyer because I bullied their sales team into not going on that 30 minute demo. I was like, mm. listen, I know this, I know this, I know this, I don't want to do it. At the time I was busy. Um, and so like, I didn't have the time to invest. Um, but what did I do with the tool? I used it a couple of times, paid 30 bucks a month for four to six months and then canceled because I was like, I'm just not using it. I prefer Gmail and nothing against the tool. And like, I'm not even sure I can confidently say I prefer Gmail over Superhuman. I, nothing against the tool. I think it was just largely uh, my resistance to that onboarding that was um, probably why I, I prefer Gmail because I'm it's old habits, right? Yeah, yeah. Look, I and it's crazy. It's it's I, they want to sell you, but you have to apply to be sold to, right? So I filled out their form. And I said that I used the Salesforce widget in Gmail, right? So I could track, track correspondences and opportunities and, and tasks and all the things we, we all do. 
And they wrote back and they said, well, we don't have a Salesforce plugin. And since that seems critical to your workflow, we're going to recommend that you don't buy Superhuman today. But we'll be in touch when we do use it, when, when we do have uh, Salesforce capability. And at first I was like, I was like pissed off, you know, and I was like, what, what, what do they mean? And then I was like, screw them, you know, and then I moved on with my life and I wasn't really thinking about it. And then a colleague all of a sudden was telling me about their onboarding experience with Superhuman and the one-to-one -one demo and coaching and email optimization. And I was like, I just need, as a salesperson, I just need to go through this process for that alone. And I wrote back to them and I was like, listen, uh, now I could use the BCC on Salesforce uh, and Gmail. So that's a fine solution for me. Um, let me in. And then they let me in and, and it was great and, and it was wonderful. But it was, I wouldn't be using it the way that I'm using, using it today, which quite honestly has changed the way I interact with email and my web browser overall, um, if I hadn't sat through that demo, right? And, and um, you know, again, I was looking for that. I was curious about it. So I embraced it uh, and, and took that as a learning experience as well. But, uh, but definitely worth it. You should check it out, Colin. Nope, oh, you're muted. This section of the podcast brought to you by Superhuman. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We, uh, there are no sponsor here. We're just, yeah, I will check yeah. it out again. Um, cause it does sound super handy. Yeah. Um, so talk to me, I, you know, thanks for uh, going on that tangent with me. Talk to me about what does social selling mean to you? You're somebody that's yeah. been in the space and a multiple multitude of different angles. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm unique because not only do I believe in social selling, but I sell social right? Like that's what I do. That's, that's the air that I breathe every day. And whether it's been here at Tumblr, um, whether it was when I was working with, with Gary Vee over at VaynerMedia, or I was at a company called StumbleUpon, or a lot of my, my own clients, we're on the social media space. So this is what I, I uh, eat and breathe every day. So I know it very well. But what that, that means to me really for, for everyone is it means using social media in 2020 the way we all use social media in 2020 right? It becomes a primary form of communication uh, as a salesperson and, and again, as a human, right? It's a key tool for education, for outreach, and for reputation building. And it doesn't matter what channel you uh, care for, and it doesn't matter where you are in your career, it doesn't matter what type of product you're selling, your buyers are human, you're human, and this is how humans communicate primarily in 2020. So you got to figure it out. You got to figure out how it works for you best. Um, for me, it means the opportunity to have learned a lot about my buyers before I ever tried to sell to them. And I don't just mean, oh, you know, Colin used to, you know, be in a rock band. I mean, the industry, right? The business, them professionally, like what are the, what's the mindset of the people that they're selling to? Social media is like a cup on the wall of the world, right? You can go and you can, you can listen to everything and you can learn and you can connect and of course be entertained. Um, and that's what makes today such a unique time in, in, in culture, in business culture. Because it means that you can, you can learn um, and participate in the conversations that your potential buyers are having, right? You don't have to do it to pitch your product in the comments, right? This is where a lot of people get social selling wrong. They're like, I'm on LinkedIn. I send cold emails to everyone all the time. No one responds. Or I'm on LinkedIn. Every time someone posts, I'm like, hey, if you like this, you'll like my business over here. That's not social selling, right? Like you'd be a jerk if you behave like that at a party. You'd be a jerk if you behave like that on Facebook with your friends from high school. Um, so, so, don't, so don't do it there, right? It, you have to participate. You have to add value. You show people how you think, become trusted, right? People talk about consultative sales. Listen, it's about, it's about building trust. It's about being a keeper of, of knowledge and information and having the broader context on the people you're selling to uh, and highlighting the thoughtfulness of, of packaging all that up that you'd ultimately bring to your clients, right? It means, I mean, sharing content, whether it's original from yourself or from your marketing team that's creating assets from you uh, or from a Slack channel where you're promoting good news. It means celebrating wins that aren't only yours, right? And whether that's on your team or other companies or friends or partners or former colleagues, elevating people like that, that's a wonderful thing, right? Elevate people who aren't yourself. Right. Social media is, I think, one of the fallacies people have is that it's about you. Right. Like, really, it's about the community and the conversations that you can have. Same on the consumer side, same on the business side. Um, 
we know that CEOs and we know that admins are all using the same tools, are all getting the same information. And that means we have access to the same information. We have access to the same people, whether we want to pull them into our orbits or we can ha allow ourselves to be pulled into their orbits. So to me, it's not about selling that one product. It's about establishing yourself and what you do over a long term. Right. And obviously you want to hope that the companies you work for invest in you so that you stay there for the long term. And this value that you're creating as an individual seller, right, or as a sales leader uh, extends itself to them. Um, and I'm lucky. Look, I've been selling after my diamond days. Right. Though I've sat on different sides from SaaS to agency to media. I have been selling to marketers most of my career. And I have been selling to people who are focused on social media and content. Right. So for me, it's a ongoing project, if you will, to be an expert in all things digital marketing, digital media, and social, so that regardless where I work, and, I'm, and, and, and I love Tumble, right, um, as, as a user, first and foremost, but regardless where, where I've worked or where I might work down the road, um, it's, uh, it's just so important, right? I remember when I was at, at Vayner and we were talking to potential B2B clients, right? They would come in and talk to us. And this was a couple of years ago. So obviously I think the market from like a B2B marketing standpoint has caught on to social a little bit more than they had in like 2015. But back then they would, they would want to hear from us and they would say, well, you know, we, we're trying to drive people to download white papers so we can put them in our flow and have them, you know, run a nurture these leads for the long term." And, and, and I would be on calls with them. And these were like major, major organizations. Uh, and they were like, and I would say to them, you know, all these people are on Facebook, right? We can run ads targeting all of them. You're not even on LinkedIn. You're not publishing organically to LinkedIn, right? Uh, forget the fact that brands are now on, uh, B2B brands are now on Snapchat and TikTok and, and everywhere else. So I think that, I think that um, in B2B marketing, which, which ties so closely to sales, we're behind the ball on it. And, and it all ties together because it's creating leads and it's creating context. And to me, it really is all the same thing. As a salesperson, I'm marketing my company every day when I'm out speaking to clients. I am a touch point for them and I'm going to impact what they think of and, and, and how, they, how they perceive my brand. Um, I was reading in preparation for this, I was looking through some of LinkedIn's material on social selling and they actually have like a social selling index uh, zero to hundred, but just based on your LinkedIn activities. I, I didn't know this existed until uh, yesterday. So if some of you are surprised, you can, you can do a quick Google search and, and figure it out. But, and obviously this is biased towards LinkedIn. Well, they said folks with a high social selling index are 45% more likely to get sales opportunities, 51% more likely to hit quota and 78% outsell peers who don't use social media. So, at least per LinkedIn, right? The, the, those numbers seem to be saying something. And I don't need LinkedIn to tell me that because I'm a human. And because I see how we all communicate and collaborate online, especially now in the current world, uh, now, now more than ever. And um, if you do it poorly, buyers know the game, right? Every day I see on Twitter, I see on LinkedIn, screen grabs with the seller's name blacked out. Of, Look how this person send a cold outreach to me and what kind of value does this person think they're creating with this message, right? So you have to think about it. You have to try um, and you have to differentiate yourself, right? That doesn't necessarily mean you need to host your own podcast. That, that, that can work, but figuring out what's going to work for you, for your product and for your consumer, right? The person you're selling to, what did they do and how can uh, you ape that behavior to get onto their radar? I really like what you, you sort of, you mentioned a couple of times about that, um, the different communities, because I, I think it's the perfect analogy. And, and I think the mistake that I've made in the past is not thinking them as communities, is thinking of like YouTube or LinkedIn as platforms. And from my perspective, like from a technological tools first perspective, I can put a blog post on my blog and then I can stitch together some tools so that gets shared on LinkedIn. It gets shared on, you know, all these different tools. We share it off, share it on all of our social media, but that's not being present in the community, 
right? That, that's sort of like, if you, if you take the physical community parallel, it's like walking around with a flyer. I mean, like, here's some stuff I did, you know, in a different platform. It's not actually showing up and being and coming to a town hall meeting or having a conversation with your neighbors or hanging out at a local coffee shop. That's just like, it's a one-sided conversation and it's not being present in those communities. Well, the interesting thing, Colin, there is what you described is a tactic that I've seen a lot of salespeople do in person, in the room, right? Take that digital forum and make it an industry conference and take that flyer and make it a business card. And you've got salespeople who are so tone deaf and lack such self-awareness that they walk over to people trying to have a nice drink, interrupt their conversation and throw a business card in their face and start going into an elevator pitch because they think that's their one at bat. And, and so it's the same thing, right? Like bad sales behavior and not being aware of the people you're selling to is something that happens online and something that happens in forums and communities and message boards. And it's something that happens in person all the time too. So it, it makes total sense. Interesting. Yeah. I, I think I've been guilty of it on like specifically on LinkedIn. I just haven't been present on that community. We share a lot of stuff through my profile, through the company profile, but I was, ha I was thinking about it today. I'm like, we don't, create any content specific for, specifically for LinkedIn. I've done a couple of things, um, but it just, I don't know, for, for me as somebody who's, I'm a bit of a social media Luddite. I, I'm, I, you know, I had Twitter back in the early days. I was like, okay, maybe this can be a growth channel for us. I did the like follow on follow hacks to get up to like 5,000 followers. Um, and I was like, ah, I don't really get any value out of Twitter. I'm going to set it aside. Never really paid attention to my LinkedIn. And I'm sort of realizing that, it, like you said, it is a community. You need to be a, a good actor in that community and not just try somebody that's there trying to hack hack it, not just one of those people that show up at the marketing or at the sort of networking events, handing out business cards to absolutely everybody that they meet. You're not there to have a genuine conversation. You're there to promote, you're there to promote. And it's so obvious in person. It took me a while to sort of make, to connect the two dots that this is the, you know, whether you're having a conversation online or having a conversation in person, you need to be there to have a conversation and connect first and not just promote, promote, promote. I, I think, I think, I mean, you're spot on, you're spot on. I, I think, a few things, right? Not like these, these platforms have evolved and they've changed and LinkedIn has become much more of a community driven platform in the past few years than it was before where it was primarily for, for that broadcasting. Right. And I think that for me, every social media platform I I've been on, you know, even, even Tumblr where I was, I was user like 50,000 after it launched. Um, I didn't post for a year. I observed. And again, I didn't have business, thoughts in, in mind, like for Tumblr at the time, but I was in a new space. I was in a space where other people were having conversations and I was trying to suss out what was going on, what the role for me and how I would be comfortable on that platform. And while I didn't necessarily take a year um, of watching on Twitter and uh, certainly not LinkedIn, which I just loved from day one, because I, I used to be like that connection, people would be like, Hey, Ari, what's up with Colin Stewart? And I'd be like, Oh, well, he's in Vancouver and you know, as he's crushing his podcast. Uh, so, so I always loved LinkedIn because it was like that. And I always loved social media because of that. Um, but I think it, it understanding and learning the, the, the native behavior of a platform and, and how people interact is, is really what helps drive success for anyone. Again, whether you're, um, selling a mass market product to consumers or you're in the B2B space. Um, you know, I, I look, uh, I'm part of a lot of advertising and media strategy and, and brand strategy, Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups. And it's not because I'm a brand strategist. It's not because I'm an advertiser. I mean, do I think strategically? Sure. Right. But is my, is that my job? No, but I want to understand the problems of, of, that I'm trying to solve, that I'm trying to bring solutions for, right? And I want to understand the language that those people are using. And I want to understand how they communicate with themselves so that when I approach them and when I do join in that conversation, I don't get that eye roll of here comes the sales guy about to ruin everything, right? I get that eye roll of one, someone who's been noticed as being a little bit of a passive uh, participant, right? Um, but someone who is truly knowledgeable and can speak their own language to them, right? And, it, and at that point, it's no longer a script. It's no longer that I'm aping, um, you know, a playbook. It's that I've, I've actually done the work and I understand them. Um, and that makes people like talking to me, right? Like that, uh, that, that helps me be a better communicator. 
that, that helps me be a salesperson who, you know, for my successes and for my failures, and, I, and I've absolutely had failures on the brand level and, and certainly on the, on the one-off deal loss, if you will. Um, but, you know, I've always been known as a, and I've always tried to encourage people to sell, but not to be that salesperson that everyone uh, starts hiding when they see you coming in person or online. Totally fair. Um, and I love that you're immersing yourself in those channels. You're being an, uh, a, com- a member of the community in good standing. And I think that's like a, such a great tactic um, just to, to get in there and, and develop a better understanding for your, your customers and the sort of target buyers that you're going after. Because um, so much like we're buying, like you said, we're buying from humans and we want to buy from people that understand what we're going through, not just somebody that understands their quota and how to make the most amount of money on their next commission check. Um, I'm curious, like that's such a great insight is in terms of just like being a member of that community. I'm wondering with some of the other tactics, if we're talking about how you like to sell socially, can you talk to me about what some of those are? Yeah. Um, you know, one I think is you have to have a presence across all social channels and what you do with it is, is really entirely up to you. Again, if you want to be more passive, if you want to create your own content, if you want to share other people's content, um, if you want to share totally non-business related stuff, right? Like I talk about a lot of things on Twitter that may offend some people. Uh, I talk about a lot of things that have nothing to do with advertising or media or technology, but I talk about those things as well, right? I show that I'm a person. That's, that's sort of one of the, the interesting uh, dynamics of social media is that it's made us all, uh, all of our interests and all of our humanity so much more public, right? It used to be that you're like, well, this is me at work and I behave this way and speak this way. And then when I'm with my, uh, you know, friends here, I behave this way. And when I'm home with my wife and kids, I talk like this, but social media has made it all public, right? So I'm not saying you have to scrub all of your sports talk or your hip hop conversations or fashion or whatever, whatever drives you as a person. In fact, I think you should tie those things together, right? Like I've written medium posts um, about how uh, the Beastie Boys and listening to the Beastie Boys as a seven-year-old, right? Or six-year-old actually um, made me a brand loyalist for Adidas, right? Like the only sneakers I wear are Adidas sneakers. And I talk about that and how that impacted my belief in content and influence and celebrity endorsement and building brand loyalty. Um, I was spending some time going to different events in the cannabis space, right? And some marketing events just to, to learn about the emerging space. And it wasn't an area that I was selling into, but it was an area that I see is coming and people are interested and people are talking about. So I want to learn. Like I want, I want to be able to talk to people about these things. And I went on, I don't remember if it was Medium, LinkedIn, like I, I made a post about that. It was not relevant to my sellers of the company and the product that I was representing that day, but it showed this broad interest and it showed me to be a unique, different thinking type of person, right? Um, So I think being on the platforms, doing something unique. uh, I did a LinkedIn series. And again, not everyone has to do this. You can go to LinkedIn and share great articles from TechMeme or AdAge or the Wall Street Journal or wherever it might be. or, or you can add your commentary to it or, or you know, you, you just, you have to be there, right? For me though, um, I did a LinkedIn series for six months. I did about a video every other day or so on and off. And it was three things that I was interested in that day. I called it RE3, right? And I would use the tag ARI3 or A3. Um, and I talked about business. I talked about media. I talked about technology. I talked about cultural trends that I was observing as a consumer of the world, right? And did I hide the fact that I worked for a company and ultimately I was trying to sell their products? Absolutely not. And I would mention, oh, this is Ari from here, from Brand X. Um, and and, and uh, this is, this is what, what's happening. Um, but it was never hey, now that I have your attention, let me tell you about my great product and why you should call me up for a demo and I can pass you off to someone on my team to walk you through that demo to pass you off to someone else, right? It was, um, it was just trying to show that I understand the space, that I think about a lot of interesting things. Um, and it, it gave me a little bit of a calling card for a while and it was, it was really exciting, right? Tying social channels to real life events, right? And again, obviously harder again today, but we'll be back there. So little things like Swarm, right? Formerly Foursquare. Uh, I go to a conference, I check in on, on Swarm. I see who else is checked in there. Then I see if I can find that person on Twitter, right? Then I follow them on Twitter. 
Then I see that they retweeted one of the speakers. So I retweet their retweet, right? And then we start going back and forth over the course of the conference. And then I, I, I send them a message and I say, hey, if it's not too presumptuous during the next coffee break, I'd love to just say hello and introduce myself. And we meet up for the coffee break. And do I throw, show, put my business card in their face and try and sell them? Absolutely not. I start a conversation. I ask them what they thought about the speaker. I ask them how long they're in Orlando for, right? Orlando's where all great conferences happen, I think. Um, I don't know about great, but where, where, where many conferences happen. Um, I, I might blog about an event on, on Tumblr and share the links out on Twitter. Uh, take a, shoot an Instagram story in the lobby of a client, right? I'm letting other people know this is what I'm doing. It's like showing and telling and sharing and engaging and building momentum and being, being a part of these things. And people notice it, right? Um, again, you can't be creepy about these things. You can't be a jerk about these things. It all comes back to self-awareness. Go, going back to like meeting someone for a coffee in the conference, right? Um, I'll make jokes to them. I'll be like, hey, listen, before we part ways, I'm, I got to put on my sales guy hat. And I got I to gotta ask you this. Can we set up a meeting, X, Y, Z? Like I'm still going for my clothes. I'm still going to try, try and push me to, to do business. That's why I'm there. Um, but even disarming them and having that self-awareness say I'm putting on the sales guy hat, you have no idea how many times people say, oh, that's okay. Like, like let, me, let me hear what you got. Or that's what we're here for. Or listen, you're just doing your job, right? So they give me permission at that point to sell to them because I'm not trying to sell, right? And nothing is better than someone sound, saying, please sell to me, like I'm interested, like let, let, let me hear your pitch. Uh, again, if uh, I hope I'm not rambling too much, right? But I, I could go on, it's about reading the room and online, not being a braggart, not being pushy. Um, you, you certainly don't wanna put people off. And again, this is self-awareness. I love sales because it's a study of people. Right? I have to understand how people think and under, understand how people work and understand how I think and how I can tweak that and, and push that to, uh, to, to close the deal. Right? And it just takes putting in the work and the thought. And, and uh, you know, I think I said this before, understanding people's drivers and motivators. Social media, um, and, it, and it is really just a tactic. Listen, right? Like listen to what people are saying try and understand their business, try and understand them as a, as a human as best as you can without again, being like creepy or stalkerish. Like I, I stay away from like looking at people's personal stuff on social media. I think of LinkedIn and Twitter is, and, and Quora and, and Reddit as being more, more public and more, um, more, more appropriate than being like, oh, I saw your Instagram pictures, vacation looked nice, you know? Um, it's weird enough when you do that with your friends now. Uh, so yeah, all, all those things. Look, just give, give value, learn, have fun. I love how you ask. Not only did, did you, and, and those that are just listening might have missed out on or probably missed out on this because you can't see them, but I love when you asked, can I put my salesperson hat on? You actually did the motions <laughs> of like putting a hat on. <laughs> uh, I, that's funny. I do the same thing, even, even at a conference, like, Hey, you know, I got a responsibility here. Company sent me here cause I am a salesperson in this context. So hats on, let's mm -hmm. have a chat, you know, and like you ask their permission, you get their buy-in to make that transition, which, which can be in, an awkward thing. And so you kind of make it a, a silly, you know, I'm calling it out. I'm asking permission to sell to you. Um, I love that. Uh, you, you like super valuable. I know you spent some time at Gary V uh, mm. or uh, at VaynerMedia with Gary. Um, can you talk to me about, you know, some of the examples of uh, things that you saw that worked that, that uh, really worked there? Yeah. I mean, look, Gary, Gary's written books. On, like he's, he's written uh, jab, 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 jab hook, right? Like the ultimate idea of, and he, he really helped popularize that. Uh, and certainly uh, a beloved figure among salespeople of, of giving value, right. Of, of, giving value in every way before you earn the right to ask for something. Uh, and, and, you know, Gary is uh, one of the most amazing salespeople in the world, right? And I was very lucky to spend uh, close to two years riding shotgun with him and, and seeing him in, in so many different environments. And what I saw is someone who really bridges a lot of what I'm saying here, right? Like there's a reason I went to work for him and, um, and there's a reason why I love working there uh, because bridging this, it's like human social divide and remembering that uh, we, you have to communicate with all people in the way that people communicate, right? On social, in person. 
uh, the ability to read a room and understand what people want because you have that knowledge, because you do that research. Um, it's just all about adding value, right? Like that's such a, that's such a Gary thing to say, but it's, it's really just about adding value and it's, it's about looking to help people, right? It's not just putting out, you know, YouTube videos. It's about helping people find jobs. It's about connecting people to investors. It's about building relationships and playing a long game in your career and when building your business uh, that makes all the difference. Beautiful. I'm, I'd love to get kind of get deep into, you know, we've talked a lot about some of the, you know, your, your thoughts, your beliefs on, on social media. Let's get into sort of dive deep on some of the tactics here uh, for a minute. Um, you talked about sort of reading the room, you know, talk to me a little bit about how um, if somebody's listening here and they're like, Hey, I'm not sure how to do that. Or I'm not, you know, I haven't done this before. Or maybe it's not a strength of mine. What's um, how do they go deep on this one? Yeah, I think one, one thing is the reason that most people don't read the room is because they don't listen and they don't watch. And the reason they don't do that is because they're underprepared and they're spending their time worried about what they have to say and what they're going to say next instead of looking out for the signals from the other people in the room. Um, so I think doing your preparation in advance and knowing your pitch and believing in your pitch and your story and whatever it is that you're selling and being able to speak about it gives you confidence and it gives you confidence to put the focus on that on the back burner, right? Like I know my pitch, so I'm going to put that to the side and I can, and, and I know my deck is going to work and I've got my IT set up, right? Like I'm going to be able to project or whatever it might be. So that's not a concern for me. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to listen, right? One thing that I've only really recent, I've recently become um, an aggressive note taker right? That's something that I didn't do before. And it's hard, especially when you are listening, right? Um, it's hard to keep up sometimes. Uh, but I've started taking a lot of notes because that, that helps me tie back the things I'm hearing to my own talking points as the conversation moves ahead, right? Um, uh, so so that, that's just one way, right? Like, listen, there are people who are just innately good at reading a room and understanding people. And I understand that it's not everyone. And I understand that not uh, that, that that's just not everyone. But I think there are things that you can do to help you better understand that. And so much of it comes to doing the work before you even get in the room. I love that. I, one of my favorite books, and I probably reference this more than any book, even predictable revenue on this podcast, but never split the difference. And they talk about going into the, into a negotiation and you fall to your lowest level of preparation. And it, it's, mm. it's the exact same thing, whether you're going to a conference, you're going on a sales call. If you, if you don't have that unconscious competence surrounding what you're going to do, you're going to be thinking about it. And when you're thinking about, Oh, my projector, my keyboard, my this, my that you're dedicating precious brain cycles to the, technology and the tactics as opposed to the people. And it's a distraction. It, it pulls your brain away from what you need to be focusing on. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's almost a cliche in like the tech world at this time, but you know, people, whether it's Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg, you know, talking about wearing the same thing every day, it's just like one less thing to think about. So you can focus on your actual goal and what you're actually doing. So I think it carries over outside of sales as, as, as well. But who, who are those folks, but some of the, you know, Steve Jobs, one of the most brilliant salespeople also of all time. Totally agree. Um, that was not that I'm trying to emulate Steve Jobs, but I remember reading that and I was like, that's a really smart idea. And I think I bought like eight t-shirts, um, like nice t-shirts that I just kind of rotate through. So I never have to worry about like what I'm wearing on the podcast. It's, it's one of those eight. Um, and a bunch of them are the same color. And so I I've probably got, rotate I've through like three different color of the same shirt. I've got six of these same uh, like button downs that I'm wearing right now. And yeah. listen, I've, I've got, I've got plenty of other stuff also, but like, it's just one of those things you, you also get to a certain age where you're like, I found something that worked. I'm good. You know, totally. Like, there's more important shit to worry about. A hundred percent agree. Um, I want to get to get to one last, one last one before we get to the, to my favorite section, uh, the cold call where I get to make you sweat just a little bit. All right. How, I'm, because there are so many communities out there, right? Their social media is now so much more, so much larger, larger than just Facebook and Twitter. There yep. are tons of platforms. How do you figure out where your buyers are? Yeah. Um, you got to do some research again. You, you got to put the work in, right? Like, listen, e even though there's a lot of other niche places, there's certainly very centralized places like Facebook and like Twitter and like, in, uh, and, and like um, LinkedIn. And I think that from those places, it's, it's sort of easy to see where people are spending other time, uh, spending their time. 
I think it's knowing your audience overall, right? Like it's not necessarily about me saying, well, I'm trying to sell to Colin. So let me figure out everything Colin does online. It's about saying, I know I'm trying to sell to people in, let's say ad ops, ad, ad, advertising operations, right? For, I want to sell them some software. I know because I'm in this space and I talk to a lot of people that there's an incredible ad ops community on Reddit, right? Where people, where people go so deep. So it's something you have to know. And then I can go there and then I can look. And then I could see, oh, well, is this person there? Or I could use that information to go back to Colin or whoever, you know, buyer X might be and, and share a tidbit of information. Maybe they don't know about that conversation that's happening on Reddit. That would be so relevant to them. That's going to be a lot more exciting than, um, you know, the TechCrunch headline that every other seller is sending them, right? It shows you did the work. It shows you understand their space and you're giving value. You're not just giving them that article. You're actually handing them the key to a new place for them to learn and explore. So to, you got to do the work. Um, you got to be active on these platforms yourselves and figure them out and see what's trending and see what's interesting. And, and, and you got to live it. Right. And you got to, and this is hard. I, I'm very grateful. Right. I, I love my job. I love selling advertising and, and, and building the business at Tumblr, right? I've loved most of the jobs that I've had. So I've been uh, very happy to sell those products and to help those companies grow and to, and to do my part. And I know that's not the case for everyone, right? But the truth is, that's the part of it where, where if you're going to do it, you, you got to at least fake it, right? Like, because, because that's just what's going to make the difference. And, and I think that as a salesperson, as a sales leader, you want to be invested in the, in the, success of your company, right? It's not just about you and hitting your quota and your team's quota. Don't get me wrong. That's very, very important, right? But it's about what is the impact as me as a cog in the marketing machine, because I am a public facing touch point for my brand that impacts us over the long run. And maybe if you dominate your industry, you can get by for a long time with, with bad salespeople or with disrespectful salespeople or thoughtless salespeople. Um, but over the long term, that'll hurt you, and it'll hurt your brand, and it'll hurt your business. And um, you know, th th this is all tied to so much more, right? It's tied to hiring, and it's tied to culture, right? Which obviously can can be a little bit cliched, but it but it's real, and and it's and it's um, it's tied to it's tied to everything you do in your business, right? Sales isn't a discipline that sits by itself. Sales is an arm, um, a, a strong arm, right? Of of a larger body that's that's trying to uh, get to a specific goal. Of course. I, I'd love to just wrap before we get to the cold call. Can you share, what are some of your favorite little social niches that you're hanging out in right now? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm a big hip hop fan, right? So I'll go anywhere where there's great uh, underground hip hop and nineties hip hop. And that's still places like SoundCloud, right? You can still find a lot of great stuff. That's um, a lot of great blogs. I lived in Australia, as I mentioned before, so where, uh, I spend a lot of time diving still into Australian hip hop and, and, and some of the blogs around that. Um, I mentioned Facebook, like some, some Facebook groups have been really wonderful, learning more about strategy and how people approach strategy and think about it. strategy specific to, to advertising and, and, and to marketing. Um, you know, I mentioned that ad ops on, on Reddit, that's, that's a super cool place to, to spend time. Um, and then um, Tumblr, right? I got to put my sales, per, my sales hat on, right? right. Um, like, like Tumblr, there's just, uh, as, as someone who's passionate about internet and internet culture, uh, Tumblr always has been and continues to be sort of the, the wellspring from which internet culture comes, right? Across music, we have a long thread and long history of emerging artists coming up. We have photographers and writers, writers and visual aesthetics and, and political movements that all come up. So, um, you know, even now in 2020, even though we've been around for a while, we're still very much countercultural and, and underground. And, and there's no better place to spend some time if you want to know what is going to seep into the mainstream culture, right, whether it's business or otherwise, um, in six months, a year, two years. Very cool. Um, I'll definitely check it out. I remember having a Tumblr and a StumbleUpon account like way, way back in the day, um, uh, back when StumbleUpon was like, I think it was one. It was one of the first social networks. I mean, it's up there with like uh, MySpace and Friendster and all that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, it, it was it was that that similar era, but what differentiated it 
then, and also, you know, again, not to, not to keep my sales hat on, but from a Tumblr perspective also, is that they're both interest driven, right? Like Friendster and Facebook and Instagram, they're very much based on who you know, right? Um, uh, StumblePon was about finding cool things online, right? And what you were interested in. Tumblr's about finding those cool things and sharing them and collecting them and curating them. And, and, and they're, they're very different ways of, of thinking and, and, and behaving, right? Not like just who I am, but also what do I care about? Beautiful. Um, thanks so much, Ari. Um, let's get to the, the cold call part of this. So as we transition, talk to me about uh, who am I, like who's your target buyer? What's my role? What kind of company do I work for? Yeah. I mean, it's funny you call it a cold call. I, I don't think I've actually had a, a phone on my desk in 15 years. Right. So it's been a, been a long time since I, I've, I've actually made a cold call, but ultimately uh, look, I'm selling to marketers. So whether you're a um, CMO of a, of a large brand or whether you're a brand director or um, a media buyer on their agency or a head of digital at their agency or whatever it might be, uh, you are someone who is responsible for managing the brand's presence on the internet. Cool. All right. You ready for this? I'm going to do a ring ring and then we're, then we're live. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Ring ring. Hey, this is Colin. Hey Colin. What's going on, man? This is Ari from Tumblr. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing well. Happy, happy Friday. Um, I know, I know it's a little bit late in the day, so I just want to check in. Do you, do you have a few minutes to chat? I get two minutes. I'm just heading into a meeting though. All good. All good. I'll only take two minutes of your time. And, and, and if you're interested, I'm happy to continue the conversation later. Um, I, I just wanted to ask before I get started, are, are you familiar with Tumblr? Uh, I, I had an account a few years ago, but I haven't logged in recently. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, well let, me, um, let me just give you a quick spiel and tell you a couple things that I think you should think about. Um, we're a blogging platform and a social network in one. Really, we're um, the best part of the open web paired with a, a dashboard, like an in-stream feed, if you will, that delivers a stream of internet awesomeness based on users' passions and interests, right? So a little bit different than your typical social platform, which is driven by who you know. Um, I know the predictable revenue as a blog, and I checked it out. You've got some great long form content out there. And I saw your links to other social platforms. So you obviously get the value of content marketing. You obviously get the value of social media. Um, so since you haven't yet, unless you're working on something on the DL, consider building a presence on Tumblr. Um, I want to let you know a couple things quickly, just, just so I know. Have you considered building a presence on Tumblr? It hasn't been on my radar. Oh, good. Cool. Uh, well, look, uh, three things. You could post anything to Tumblr, right? Video, infographic, long form, GIF, of course, or, or even, even a podcast, right? Put it in a centralized hub that looks and feels just like your brand, even using a custom URL. Second thing to know, once people start following you on Tumblr, there's no algorithm dictating what your audience will or won't see. So if someone says, I want to follow predictable revenue, every time you publish to your blog, I'm going to get it in my feed of internet awesomeness, and I know you'll be producing some internet awesomeness. And the third thing is that if for whatever reason you're hesitant and you're not ready to press publish, but you want to reach our audience, you can still advertise with us. We've got 33 million users in the U.S., 25% we know are overlapping with LinkedIn, right? So there's definitely some uh, folks that are business minded there. Those numbers come from Comscore, so you know. And uh, we can put together a nice targeting pool and try and find people whose interests align with yours. So I know you've got a meeting. I know I've rambled. Uh, I'm gonna send through a one sheet to your email as well as some links of just my personal favorite tumblers, like cool things that I'm seeing. And uh, let me know, do you think Tuesday it might be a good day to reconnect and chat through a little bit more? Tuesday sounds great. Awesome. I'll, uh, I'll send that email out and uh, have a great weekend. Appreciate Thanks, your time. Ar Thanks, Ari. That was great, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, that, was, that was super interesting. Um, really cool to see, to hear about the, like my one biggest complaint that I hate about Facebook and some of these other platforms is the algorithm, like just dictating what content you see. Um, so super cool. I'm definitely going to check it out. Awesome. And when you're ready to onboard uh, to Tumblr, let me know and we'll give you the VIP treatment. I appreciate that. Um, Anytime. Thanks, you, thanks for having me on. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, if people are love the chat today, want to reach out, want the VIP RE treatment, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Yeah. Uh, Ari at Tumblr.com. Ari Levine on Twitter. Ari Levine dot Tumblr.com on Tumblr. Um, that's about it. I think that's a good starting point. 
for oh, some and LinkedIn hit me up. Let me know. Let me know what was interesting. Why you might want to chat further. Cool. I'm just going to wrap by saying like, you must be OG to Tumblr if you've got Ari at, at a company that's been, been around and is so for so long and is so large. There's a, there's a funny backstory to that, that, uh, that I'll, I'll save, I'll save for the next time you have me on. Right on. No, well, thanks for coming on the show, Ari. My pleasure. Thank you. Right on. Thanks everybody. We'll see you all next week. All right. Shout out to Predictable Revenues, Service LinkedIn Outbound, service for sponsoring this video. As a founder and sales leader myself, I, I know most of the best practices in terms of like what I need to be doing on LinkedIn, um, but sometimes I just don't have the time. Um, you know what the right things to do are, but it just it comes down to a trade-off of what's what's a better, where, where's my time better spent? Um, and can I find somebody to do, to click around on LinkedIn for me and book meetings, you know, and then I can focus on higher level activities. Um, and so think about it. What's the best use of your time? If you're a founder, sales leader, and you have a team, you need some meetings, I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, I'm using it myself. I'm obviously the founder, so eating our own dog food. Um, but if you're curious, click the link below to learn more. Thank you.